Sometimes I think back to Super Bowl 49 and what could have been. The Seattle Seahawks got that great catch from Jermaine Curse, that spectacular, really forgotten now catch because the Seahawks ultimately didn't win that game. But you're in position. You're breathing down the goal line. Here's your chance to really stamp your place in history. Granted, you've already got a Lombardi trophy in the trophy case. But here's a chance to go back to back. And with a young franchise quarterback, an elite defense full of talent at all three levels, you're thinking that this is a team that not only could win two in a row, but could they be the team that finally wins three straight Super Bowls? Never happened in NFL history. So many great teams never accomplished it. Even teams that went back-to-back, -back, the Green Bay Packers. You could say they won three world championships in 65, 66, 67, but they only technically won the first two Super Bowls. You think back to the Steel Curtain. Yes, at one point in time, they went back-to-back -back in 78 and 79, but they never were able to win three straight championships. Just so many teams over the years, you know, even teams that won it one year and got back the next year and weren't able to seal the deal, like the Washington Redskins, the Green Bay Packers of 97. I mean, you know, you look at the Denver Broncos, won it 97-98, Elway retires, Terrell Davis tears up his knee, and they're not even in the playoffs in 99. You know, the Patriots went back-to-back, -back, but they couldn't do three in a row. And nobody's ever done it, three straight Super Bowls. The Cowboys of the 90s couldn't do it. They won three in four years, and that's hellified impressive. The 49ers of 88 and 89 went back-to-back, -back, but again, they couldn't do three in a row, and they had two Hall of Fame quarterbacks on their roster. Just speaks to how difficult it is, in particular in today's salary cap era, where everybody wants to get paid, and you can only afford to pay so many guys so much, and once you make a Super Bowl, win a Super Bowl, it just drives... Uh, less than stellar players' prices through the fucking roof, and you just can't afford to keep that core together for too long. But again, you look at the Seattle Seahawks, a young franchise quarterback, one of the best running backs in the National Football League, combined with arguably the best defense all around in the National Football League. Why couldn't they be the ones? Why couldn't they be the team to win three straight? All you have to do is find a way to score. Hand the ball off to Marshawn Lynch. Throw a fade to freaking Chris Matthews, who was on fire in that game. Do anything other than on second and goal at the one, throw a slant to Ricardo Lockett. It's that one play that, to me, has changed kind of the whole aura of the Seattle Seahawks organization and, frankly, changed the history of the National Football League, at least for this decade that we're in. The Seahawks were primed and poised to dispatch of the New England Patriots and stamp their place and say, we are now the gold standard of the National Football League. We are the HNICs of all that you see when it comes to the football field. You would have dispatched the dynasty of the past decade and a half and become that themselves. But instead now, you look at what's happened with the Seahawks, the two seasons since that, They've made the playoffs both years, made it to the divisional round both years, but it's just not the same. And you look at 2016, it was 10-5-1, so a good year, but not a great year. They overcame some injuries to some key players, uh, lost Earl Thomas due to injury, not to mention the fact that Marshawn Lynch beast mode had hung it up. Um, it just kind of changed the identity of the team. They just didn't have that same presence in the backfield. They still didn't have quite the same ability to control the game and impose their will physically on the offensive side of the ball like they once did. Um, well, so while they won the NFC West, which wasn't saying much this past season, and they won a playoff game, granted it was against the Detroit Lions, and they were at home, so what did that really mean? You know, when they faced a good team like the Atlanta Falcons, they got their shit pushed in, basically. And, you know, that's the whole trick for the Seattle Seahawks, and I think one of the flaws, just kind of the way I see it for the Seahawks, are very talented team. A team with enough pieces in place that if things break right, they can contend for a championship. They can win a Super Bowl. But at some point in time, if you don't change some of the things that you do and you're not able to adapt and adjust, teams will eventually figure out your weaknesses and they will exploit the hell out of them. And the Atlanta Falcons were kind of that buzzsaw this year. And they were the team that was just able to exploit those weaknesses and take advantage of them. And you start to look now 
at the Seahawks team and you say, if you don't adjust what you do, if you don't adapt, and you just kind of go out there and play, you know, are you ever going to get back to the promise line? You know, injuries are a problem. Your inability to protect Russell Wilson is a bigger problem, which stems in part from your inability to consistently and effectively run the football to the same level that you used to. Part of that is because you don't have the same quality of back that you used to have in Marshawn Lynch, and some of that is, again, because of the doo-doo-ass offensive line up front. But I really look at this team, and I just sit there and think, you know, maybe that window's closing. Maybe that championship window has already closed. They've got quite a few key players that are already 30 or older heading into 2017. Guys like Jimmy Graham and Michael Bennett, Cliff Averill, Atai Rubin, Tony McDaniel. You've got other guys like Cam Chancellor and Richard Sherman. They're going to be 29 in 2017. You've got Earl Thomas, who I think is like 28. He's teetering on the line of potentially retiring at some point. They're not done yet. They're not has-beens yet. But if the Seahawks team isn't careful, they're going to get to that point sooner rather than later. They're going to. And they have to adapt and adjust. And one of the big things I'm referencing when I talk about adapting and adjusting is they have to improve that offensive line. It is a miracle that Russell Wilson is even still in the league based off of how bad the pass protection has been in front of him from that offensive line the past couple of years. If you do not better protect your franchise guy, all that money you sunk into him goes to waste, and you have wasted a real, real nice window of opportunity to win multiple championships. Do you want to be the 85 Bears with one memorable team, one dominant team that won a Super Bowl in impressive fashion? But we also remember how they didn't win it in 84, they didn't win it in 86, they didn't win it in 87, they didn't win it in 88. They had really a five-year window where they could potentially win a championship, and they won just one. Just one. Do you want to be that team? Or do you want to be a team like the Dallas Cowboys that can win three championships in four seasons? A team that can go back to back. Is that the type of team from the 90s that you want to be now? This team has got to, got to address that offensive line. It is that simple. They've got to get better at both tackles. You cannot be serious and be that arrogantly stubborn in your belief of evaluation and system that you can take undrafted guys and really hope that they can be your long-term answer at right and left tackle. Championship contending teams, for the most part, just don't do that. But the Seattle Seahawks are trying to get away with that crap, and it's blowing up in their face. I know part of it is the fact that somewhere on your roster you have to bite the bullet from a salary cap standpoint because of the money you pay guys like Russell Wilson and Jimmy Graham and Doug Baldwin and Michael Bennett, Cliff Averill, uh, Richard Sherman, Cam Chancellor, Earl Thomas, Bobby Wagner. You know, I understand you can't pay everybody, and not every position can get the same prioritization in terms of salary cap dollars. That's just not the reality for the Seahawks. But at some point in time, you have to look at it and you have to say, yeah, we got to get better. We just have to get better. And even in a weak offensive line class, the Seahawks must address that position multiple times. Frankly, they could also address running back. I like the combination of Rawls and ProSize, but those guys, if they can't stay healthy, then what the hell good are they? I also look at that defense. You could talk about that great Legion of Boom secondary. But you know Cam Chancellor is going to be 29 this year. Earl Thomas is in his late 20s, coming off of a major injury. How much longer is he going to play? Richard Sherman is going to be 29 in 2017. And the talent in terms of depth after them, people could talk about Deshaun Shedd and other people, it just doesn't measure up. And while you can sit there and say, hey, while we took Earl Thomas in the first round, we got guys like Cam Chancellor and Richard Sherman in back-to-back -back years in the draft in round five, that's great. At some point in time, you've got to invest some picks in that secondary because that secondary has been so important to what you've done for so many years. At some point in time, you got to realize that, frankly, hey, you did great with Chancellor and Sherman, but you also got kind of fucking lucky, too, at the end of the day. Because a lot of teams passed on them f at least four times in the draft, up to and including the Seattle Seahawks. 
And let's face it, frankly, if the Seahawks thought that those guys were really that talented and going to be that special, why the hell would they have waited until the fifth round to take guys like Cam Chancellor and Richard Sherman? Just think about that. Those are two areas in particular that this team has not invested marquee picks in in recent years. The outside of their offensive line and the secondary. And it is those two areas that will be the key for this team's success and the key for whether or not they can get back to the Super Bowl and get another Lombardi trophy. They must get better at the tackle position on their offensive line. And they must get, they must get more depth and talent in their secondary because it opens up so many other things that you can do with your front seven. If this team goes into this offseason, is maybe able to bring in a guy or two on the cheap, um, off the free market, and bring them in and then invest some draft picks on those two areas, this is a team that can get right back in the mix. But if they don't really address those areas and they just kind of play the old best player available game regardless of position, then this is going to be a team that you're going to remember in years to come as a team that was great for their moment, but it was a brief moment, and it should have been so much more. And they should have been wise enough to know that their window was closing. You must adapt and adjust. Otherwise, you could just watch as the opportunity passes you by. And that's what I'm afraid is going to happen with the Seattle Seahawks team if they don't adapt and adjust the way they're doing some of their things in terms of their prioritization within the NFL draft.